I don't know how many weeks ago it was, but we did an analysis of Matthew chapter 24 showing how that it is misunderstood concerning so-called signs of the time, and we spent some time on the false doctrine of premillennialism showing the proper understanding of Matthew 24 and how part of it is showing signs of the time concerning the destruction of Jerusalem to, so the disciples of that day would recognize how to flee that uh, Roman siege. And then when he starts talking about Matthew 24, the things that pertain to the end of time, of course, he does not designate any specific thing that can be noticed that would tell us anything about that. But there's another question that rises out of that false doctrine of premillennialism, and that is, uh, what is the rapture? Now, we touched on that during that sermon, but we didn't spend a whole lot of time on it. But it fits into the idea of the future kingdom theory that says that when Christ came the first time, he was going to set up his kingdom, but the Jews didn't believe on him, so he set up the church as an afterthought, and that when he comes again, he will then set up his kingdom, and that's yet in our future. He will set up his kingdom, and he will rule on earth from Jerusalem for a thousand years. And that varies according to what group is teaching it as to where he will be sitting and ruling. But they do teach such a thing, all of them, and there are variations in this doctrine according to the group that teaches it. They do teach a doctrine that talks about the church being raptured, at least most of those that we call standard denominations that would not be true concerning Jehovah's Witnesses because they vary theirs considerably on this matter. Now this theory alleges that there are two, two comings of the Lord. At the end of this present age, the first of which has him, at the end of this age, appearing in the clouds, but not to the earth itself. And that at his appearance, when he appears in the clouds, that is, at the end of this age, that the saints will be caught up to meet him and to remain with him during what they call a time of tribulation on this earth which is envisioned by them as a time of tremendous and great trouble on the earth the last a period of some seven years now if we stop there and talk about that a minute from their concept before the setting up of this kingdom that they see yet in our future then those who are as they describe it faithful to Christ in the church Remember, they make the church separate from the kingdom and the kingdom separate from the church. That they'll be caught up in what we shall call the rapture. And they will miss this time of tribulation on earth. Now, it doesn't mean that those left behind can't be saved per the false doctrine. It means that they just have to undergo all the tribulation, the horrors of whatever goes on in that seven years of tribulation. So the tribulation, according to this view, as I said, will last seven years. Then at the end of that seven years, the Lord will come with his saints. Now they will say the Lord's first coming in the clouds was for his saints. But his second coming at the end of the seven years of tribulation is with those saints that he came for when he came with the clouds before the seven years of tribulation. Then, the doctrine teaches there's the thousand, literal thousand-year reign of Christ, and most of them have him reigning from Jerusalem. This coming is to be to the earth itself. Now, keep that in mind. The tribulation has ended at the end of that seven years. So he's coming at the end of that seven years per the false doctrine with his saints, and those saints got with him at the first Resurrection, as they would call it, during the rapture. And they'll come back with him at the end of that seven years. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17, is the passage that they rely upon in their attempts to sustain their view of the first coming. 
And then they will go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21 in support of their tribulation theory. Now remember, we're addressing what is the rapture, but these things must be considered since it may be easier to understand the truth than it is to understand the false doctrine. In Matthew 24, verse 21, the scripture reads, For then shall be great tribulation, such as hath not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, nor ever shall be. Well, there's no doubt the Lord said in what he was talking about there would be a great period of tribulation. And to go on with it, because this period of tribulation is predicted to be on the earth, and our Lord was predicting it to be on the earth, the premillennialists, with absolute disregard to the context. Imagine that this is the tribulation as I've described it to you from their theory. Now, rehearse with me for a moment. Their doctrine, I'm not advocating it, I'm simply describing it, said Christ will come with the clouds and the saints in the church, remember the church is not the kingdom, it hasn't been established by that doctrine, will be caught up then seven years of tribulation on the earth. And then the Lord will come again with the saints after the tribulation is over and he will set up a kingdom, reign a thousand literal years on the earth. Well, if you just do a casual reading as we did in Matthew 24, you'll come, I think you'll see that this is, a, is completely false, for lack of a better way to put it. If it's false, I guess anything's completely false. You don't have to put word completely with it. It's just false. First of all, notice in Matthew chapter 24, verse 16, the faithful of that time period to escape the tribulation of which Jesus spoke of 2,000 years ago that would come upon Jerusalem. Those saints were told that they would need to flee under the mountains during this time of trial, of tribulation, and it would be for their protection. Now, a little thinking doesn't hurt, and I'd like to know how you're going to be able to escape what's talked about in the premillennial view of this tribulation by escaping into the mountains. First of all, he cites the mountains, the mountains of Judea. We're a little bit far from there. And if the fast uh, jet plane you can find, it's going to take a while to get there. And then how in the world is that going to save you from all that they teach about the great tribulation when you get there and flee into the mountains of Judea? So this evidence is the fact that they were not in heaven. The people to whom he addressed this almost 2,000 years ago. Because this premillennial view has them raptured into heaven at the Lord's coming in the clouds. Well, what, how, how are you going to, what's it going to do for you to escape into the mountains of Judea to escape those, that time of tribulation for seven years? Number two, if you look at verse 20 of Matthew 24, we are informed by our Lord there that the disciples were told to uh, pray to the Father, to petition the Father, that their flight from the besieged city be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. Well, the weather, in the first instance, the locked gates of the city in the second, for they locked it on the Sabbath day, wouldn't let people go in and out, is no hindrance to the premillennial contention <laughs> of the rapture before the seven years or after the seven years when the Lord comes with his saints according to the false doctrine. How would any of that fit? Of course, the Lord is showing signs of the times in the first century in which the Jewish brethren could escape the Romans when they besieged the city of Jerusalem and finally destroyed it. And with it, the temple, Christians would have a way to get out and get away from that. Well, the obvious truth is Matthew 24, 
as I said earlier, and as we studied a few weeks ago, through verse 34, is a detailed discussion of the events that pertain to the, de the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century. And it has no reference whatsoever of anything happening at the end of the Christian age, which is yet in our future. It's interesting when you read the secular historian, a Jewish historian, Josephus. He relates plainly that the Christians did indeed escape from the siege. And that they didn't perish in that terrible tribulation of the Roman siege of Jerusalem, which ended up with it being destroyed and the temple was destroyed also. The prophecy that our Lord gave of Matthew 24, all the way down through verse 34, finds fulfillment in the events pertaining to the destruction of Jerusalem. After that point, he talks about the coming at the end of this present age, and he says nobody knows when that's going to take place. And nobody does. You can set all the dates you want to set. There's nothing in Matthew 24 that says anything about that. Not only does 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 14 through 17, provide no support for the rapture theory, it proves it to be positively false when you understand it. Well, the Bible doesn't support any false doctrine. And may I say this, because it's the inspired Word of God, inspired of the Holy Spirit, God wrote the Bible through human hands. It becomes quite evident that every error that will ever come into existence has been anticipated by the Bible. And we would do well then to stick with the true doctrine of Christ and analyze everything else that comes down the pike to see whether it fits the divine pattern of inspired Scripture. Notice that in this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, and I'll, I'll read verse 14 on through it. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before, is what prevent means the King James, them which are asleep. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then he tells us, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Let's look at it a minute. This had to have meaning to the people of the day that uh, as they lived on earth and lived the Christian life because they didn't know when the Lord was coming back a second time. We don't know when the Lord's coming back. And people that begin to tell you they know are simply lying through their teeth. It tells us that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And it says it will be with a shout, with the voice of the archangel of the trump of God. Not going to be a very quiet thing, is it? He says, at that time, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then he says, we which are alive, because he had no idea whether he'd be alive or dead at the time coming. They did not know, and we don't either. They that are alive, those that are left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, notice before... Any are caught up. Before any are caught up, faithful saints will rise. Then all together, they'll go forth to meet the Lord. And where on the earth? Let me make a very bold statement. And you think about it. Any doctrine that teaches that Christ at His second coming is going to set, for, set foot upon this old earth is a false doctrine. There's not a thing in the New Testament of Christ or anywhere in the Bible that says at the second coming of the Lord that the Lord is going to set foot on this earth. Not a thing. You have to have some sort of spurious doctrine like we're talking about that does not interpret the Scriptures correctly or rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, to come up with an idea. There's one thing for sure that we ought to keep in mind. Any doctrine that implies a false doctrine is itself false. Listen, truth does not imply error. Does not. And we're taught to prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. 
And whatever is implied in the New Testament of Jesus Christ, in the way language implies anything, will not be out of harmony with what is explicitly, that is in just so many words, stated. So note carefully that Paul explains we shall ever be with him, not for seven years only, as premillennialism teach and they urge. Furthermore, contemporary with these events, we learn from the writing of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that the earth will perish in a, to sum it up, a mighty conflagration. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works of their end shall be burned up. And add verse 10 to that, by the way, 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. So these are very significant facts, and we want to assemble all the facts in their immediate and remote context that pertain to the subject before we begin to reason with them. And we are taught to reason with them, or else 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 doesn't make any sense at all. Number one, the kingdom of Christ was set up in the first century, in the year of our Lord, in the apostolic age. You can read of it in Acts chapter 2. That's when the church started. Anything that you find uh, about the kingdom or the church preceding Acts 2, it's always spoken of in the future. But when you read about the kingdom and the church, they're one and the same. The body of Christ, the temple of God, the house of God, all the same thing. Different terms representing different aspects of the one body. It always speaks of it in existence. And then in Revelation 1 and Colossians 1, Paul and John make it clear they were in the kingdom. Well, premillennialism says plainly the kingdom's out there in our future. Because they make a distinction the New Testament does not make between the church as one institution and the kingdom another. So we need to understand that people were in the kingdom in the first century when the letters of the New Testament were being written. So how could it yet be in our future? So it was set up in the apostolic age, that is the kingdom of Christ, on the first Pentecost following the resurrection and ascension of Jesus to heaven. Mark 9, 1 Jesus had said concerning some alive at that time, there be some of you standing here which shall not taste of death, then you've seen the kingdom of God come with power. In Acts 2, 1 through 4, you have the kingdom of God coming with power. Then the next point is the Lord will return on the clouds, but I say again, not to the earth itself. At that time, at the end of the age, The faithful will be caught up to be with him forever. And the third point is this. There will be no earth here for any reign of Christ, any so-called pre-millennial reign of Christ, following this present age, the Christian dispensation, because the earth will have been destroyed. And the fourth point is that the future abode of faithful children of God, the saints of God, the members of the Lord's church, members of the body of Christ, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, children of God and his family, 1 Timothy 3.15, is going to be in what's called the new heaven and new earth. And that's the place in John 14.2 the Lord went to prepare for us. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Thus, when these spurious doctrines fly up, we need to know the truth of the New Testament on the matter that we can see through them. The late G.K. Wallace debated some of these fellows as our brethren in times past when they had enough courage of their convictions about doctrinal matters to do so, they would uh, gladly meet these fellows when they would debate. And I never will forget, brother, and I probably have told this here before. In fact, I'm quite sure I have. Brother Wallace was on a parking lot. It was a car, a Cadillac, that had one of these bumper stickers on it. 
in case of rapture, this car will be empty. Brother Wallace walked up to the fellow, he was about to get in his car, and he says, in case of rapture, can I have your Cadillac? Sometimes to reduce a thing to the stupidity that it is will help some people see when they cannot and will not see otherwise. We have grown up in a situation in this country, but especially in the Lord's Church in the last 50 years, that thinks we can't, we can't speak plainly to people. Paul could say, Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Now, that's the fellow that wrote the great love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. I don't think he said something was wrong. And if you go back and look at the Greek word, you'll find out just what a blunt thing that was that he called them. These are brethren in Christ. He was instrumental in converting them to Christ. You don't think he loved them? Of course he did. But they were running after a false doctrine. A doctrine that said Gentiles can be saved, but they must first be circumcised, keep the law, or no Gentile can be saved. And Paul met that false doctrine then. And we must meet whatever false doctrine it is now. And getting somebody to see something sometimes takes a great deal. But we have the opportunity with the leavening for good on this earth. And we must take advantage of those things in dealing with our friends and our neighbors, letting them know we love them, we appreciate them, we love God and we love His truth, and we want them to know the truth. Sometimes it takes a, a lot to jar a person to get them to stop and think. You don't want to ever be hateful and mean. But brethren, when we reach a stage, as this country has reached some time ago, that to state something factually and plainly is hateful and mean, then we've completely changed the definitions. And that's just not so. And the Bible talked about, and in the lesson's yours, about when people get to calling evil good and good evil. And that's exactly where we are today on so many things. But the Bible hasn't changed. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. It's not going to change. The Word of God will mean tomorrow, a thousand years from now, just what it means today. And it means today what it meant in the first century. We need to hold to it, whether it's one or two of us, or whether it's 15 or whatever. It doesn't make any difference about the numbers. It makes a difference as to what you believe and what you practice. And since we're taught to practice the truth, because there's where our hope is, we better sacrifice all we can to be able to learn it, to know it, to practice it, and to defend it. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we offer you this opportunity to become one, to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. More than that, He doesn't enjoin upon you. Less than that, you cannot do and become a Christian as you read of it in the New Testament. The child of God, if you're caught up in one sin or more, be humble and meek, repent of it. Return to your first love by repenting of those sins, confessing them, and praying for forgiveness. Now we have this opportunity to encourage you to obey the truth, whatever you need, as we sing this song of invitation, Come, Please.